year PhD candidate at uh, ISAO uh, in Toulouse. And uh, in our lab, we have been for some, for, for some time working with different kinds of UAVs, with uh, different ar architectures. And uh, I'm going to present you today one of them. Well, imagine for, for motivation that you are a fireman, you are in your office and you get a call you, you got a bu uh, building burning, and, uh, well, you know the building address, you get your men to the truck, you get there, let's say, for 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes on the road, and uh, when you get there, you have no idea of what's going on, so you have to gather your men and spread them along the building so that you can have some sort of situation awareness. And uh, after that, as they, were, as they are spreading, they are taking actions. Uh, and when you are done, okay, you, you have took quite a, uh, you have wasted quite a manpower in the job. And uh, we tried to come up with a solution for that. What if you could send a drone? To when you get the call, let's say you have just received the call, you can get a drone, and even after, even before you leave the office, you, you have the address, you can send the drone there. The drone, you want it to go as fast as possible to the target location, and uh, while he is there, you want him to do some building intrusion, you want, you want him to be inside the building to get some intel of what's going on, and you want him to come back, and hopefully, when he comes back, you are there, you can already take your men and use them the most efficiently way as possible. So for now, let's think of what kind of UAV do we need to, to perform this task. Uh, let's try to think of it as a fixed wing. A plane, we can, okay, we can send it there. We know that it's going to take very fast. Planes are very fast. Uh, and when it gets there, we get a problem. How it's going to get inside the building? So we can't use a fixed plane. So let's try a hovering one, a helicopter or a quad hotter. Uh, he can get there, inside. But how about getting to the building? Uh, he's not as fast as a plane. Assuming he will get there at all, because quad rotors, they have limited endurance. So we will think, what about if we can take the best of uh, both worlds? and putting them together. What if we can switch between one architecture and another in a given situation? So for that, we have already several architectures already in the literature, such as tilt rotors, as the V-22 Osprey, that is very famous. We have the tilt wings. We have an example of tilt wings just before. Uh, and yesterday on the competition, the Maverick. Uh, lift fans, etc. But I'm going to talk about a very special one that we have, which is the Mavion. I've brought him here. <laughs> it's this one. And what is designed for? It is designed for horizontal vertical flight. As I told you, we want him to do building intrusion, so it's designed for be small, and it's designed to be simple. When you look at it, it's Indeed, quite simple. We need to be. We wanted to be a simple design, to have a simple manufacturing process, and to be able to make it even smaller. So, with that in mind, you look at it and you think, but well, maybe it is too simple. Uh, there's something missing here. There, are, we are all used when the pilot's missing. But uh, we have, for example, compared to a plane, there's elevons missing, there's rudder missing, there's vertical tails missing. And uh, they are not here. So this causes a problem. They are there for a reason. They make the plane more stable. So this architecture is quite unstable. And we need to really model it to be able to control it. So how does it work? Well, before getting into that, the outline of my, I'm going to present the physical mechanical model. Then we're going to, to advance to the aerodynamics model, propulsion model the simulation tools that we have developed, wind tunnel identification, some results, and a conclusion and future work assessment. Uh, first of all, this is the Mavium. We have some moving parts with respect to the fuselage, where we keep all the electronics in. 
we have uh, two propellers, left right one. We have two elevons, left and right. Uh, so these are all parts. From the mechanical point of view, uh, we have one simple rotation in the left one, one right, one simple rotation as well on the right one. And we are going to model the, we are not going to consider the elevons as the moving aerodynamic surfaces, as to separate bodies, since their mass is quite slow, it's quite uh, little, and their movement is quite slow, so we don't think it's necessary for the mechanical model for, for us to consider them as separate rigid bodies in our mechanical analysis. So there are three rigid bodies, each one of them has a weight, the, prop the propellers they are designed for creating the propulsion forces, P1 and P2. We have an aer aerodynamic forces on, on the fuselage. We have an interaction force between the propellers and the fuselage, which we'll call F1, Fi, and uh, they are a pair of action reactions, so they are also present in the fuselage. For the moments part, we have the interaction forces. They do not exactly pass through the center of mass, so they create moments as well. We have the moment due to the propeller. We have the internal moments as well, and the internal moments are a pair of reaction and action as well, so they are also on the fuselage. And the aerodynamic moments. We get all these guys, we add them, all the forces, all the moments, and we apply the, mechanic, the Newton laws of mechanics to each and every one of them. We apply the six degree of freedom, quaternions equations of motion to each and every one of them. And uh, you might notice now that this is somehow, somehow different of what is usually to do. We, are, we normally encounter the six degree of freedom equations on a, on a quad rotor, for example, or on the main body of a plane, and then we model the how the gyroscopic forces or moments are in this only body. So why did I do that? The, the equations doesn't seem to get any easier. It's a rover, an overwhelming algebra. However, you get a present from this. When you do this, you don't have to care anymore about the modeling of gyroscopic effect, effects during to the propeller in the fuselage. So the equations do not get that much complicated, no, do not, will not get as much not more complicated than they already are, the six degree of fusions, and you get already embedded the gyroscopy effects of the rotating propeller. Now, for the aerodynamic model, we have, uh, let's say these are the fixed axis of the plane of the convertible, and by the Bockingham Pi theorem, we have the forces and the moments relating to the velocity of speed of the air as we are used to. The classic equations, we assume that the flow is inviscid, is incompressible, and we have a steady flow. That means that the coefficients, the aerodynamic coefficients that we are studying there, they are just a function of alpha and beta, the angle of attack side slip, and the angle of the elephants, the aerodynamic surfaces. However, in this architecture, something happens as well. When we are flying in horizontal mode, like a plane, we get uh, a usual plane configuration. But as we turn into vertical mode, we have to increase motor to the motor, the propeller, which was on, on only responsible for winning drag, for counter drag. Now it's also responsible for making uh, weight go away. So you need to increase it, and as you increase it, the flow, the stream flow that goes, the stream leap of the propeller will also grow in intensity, and once what was negligible, now it's not. So we need to model that as well to be able to perform hover flight, and the, pro and the way we do it it's by, again, the Bockeholm Pi theorem. We can relate how the, the propulsion forces and the propulsion moments are related to each other, sorry, are related to the rotation speed. And, uh, we, have, and we can use that, the force, 
to compute uh, the induced ve velocity of the induced flow. We use that by the momentum theory and a little bit of the jet flap theory as well. We can get to this equation. This equation is already known in the literature. I just added here a little influence of the side slip because we are doing here a six degree of freedom study. So I added the side slip as well influence. And uh, with that, with all this model in hand, we can build simulation tools. And we did. This is a simulator we are developing now. It, uh, it's a simulator based on MATLAB, Simulink, and the Morse environments. But a simulation like this is not useful unless you know it, it's accurate. So we need to have real data as well. And for that, you can use compu computer fluid dynamics. You can use theory. We went for the wind tunnel, wind tunnel studies. And uh, this is the wind tunnel we used. It's, uh, it's called the Sabra Wind Tunnel Facility at uh, Iseo in Toulouse. It is specially designed for micro air vehicle studies. It is a closed loop wind tunnel for low level Reynolds, uniform laminar flow, and it's able to deliver you a wind velocity of uh, range to 2 to 25 meters per second. And we can put the whole plane in there, like you can see on the picture. This is the model we had. The electronics is, a, uh, is the same as the flying model. We have the, not only the electronics, but the scale and the geometry is the same as the flying model. You have already seen maybe the Mavion on previous IMAPs, and this is the first time we, are, we did the, the wind tunnel with exactly the same model as the flying one. So we are using an APC 745 propeller. The airfoil is the MH45. And uh, for the flying model, that one, we, are, we have a total wave of 400 grams, which uh, already includes these batteries, motors, and the embedded system, which, it, which is a game sticks, plus another computer, uh, an Armour 7 board, and the IMU and GPS for navigation purposes. And other than that, we are, we are foreseeing that it can carry an upload and a payload of 50 grams, which will make him weight total 450. Now, for the data that we gather in the tunnel, the first data that the first experiments that we did involved getting the coefficients themselves. So we did a wide envelope exploration. Since this is a convertible vehicle, you need to fly not only horizontally, you need to ride, to ride, it, to ride the experiments in a vertical position. So you need high angles of attack. So we did it for angles of attack from 0 to 90 degrees. And for several configurations of side slip and angle of slip, side slip, angle of attack, propellers, and elevons angle. So we mixed those things up, we computed the coefficients, we interpolated them, and uh, for the basic coefficient study. Another study that we did is what we call the equilibrium transition. We wanted to know what's necessary to make all the forces and moments go to zero, if we can actually maintain sustained flight. Uh, for, as you can see there, this, we actually did it. We, could, we were able to zero the forces and moments for all positions from zero to 90 degree angle of attack. And what you can see on the first graph is the motor speed. On the second graph, wind speed. On the third, the deflection of the level necessary to make it go away. From this, we can already get some results here. From the second one, you can see that the wind speed that we got for achieving uh, equilibrium is the maximum speed is 20, so this is the maximum speed of the Mavion, as computed by the tunnel. We can actually go faster here. This is the first point that we get. So for that, we also can see the propulsion that we need. We see that the propulsion has a, con it's a convex curve. It, uh, from the left, you have small angles of attack, which means he is on flight. Fast cruise mode, and you need a high motor for that. 
The second moment you need high, floor, uh, high motor is when you are at hover. And you can see here as well on the elevon part that the max elevon that we need is about 28 degrees, which is well within the efficiency of the design elevon. For now, uh, we also studied the addition of winglets on the side of the plane. We wanted to see the effects on efficiency and the aerodynamic polar of it. As for the efficiency, as predicted, we get an efficiency gain over all over the transition. And for the aerodynamic polar, we saw something very interesting, which is there's no addition of drag. We included a, a surface, we added a surface, and we get no addition of drag. We believe that that happens because we managed to add a surface. Okay, we are increasing drag, but from the other side, there are no, there are no longer tip vortices. So maybe one thing cancels the other. So it's a good thing, because as you can see, we can use them, they do not add drag, and you can use them as a natural landing device. Uh, for now, but the, this model fits reality. That was the thing we are aiming for. We need to go now back, get this data, the coefficients that we got, come back to the model, calculate in dust flow, and see if we get the forces that we were aiming for. For example, here it's a graph of the axial force predicted and, compute and measured by the wind tunnel. So it's for a full motor, for a wind speed of 10 meters per second, and we vary the angle of attack and we see what we get. Here you can see for small angles, it's quite accurate. The two of them match. But for high angles, you can see that it, they start to diverge. Uh, well, looking at it as divergent, is it that bad? Let's take a look at the Mavion now to see if we can use this model. Uh, when you are going into horizontal flight, we have an accurate model, so, so far so good. But when we are changing to vertical flight, we need to actually increase the velocity on the motors, which will increase the slipstream velocity, which will uh, eventually decrease the angle of attack, because the wind is coming in this direction, but you are flowing angle, we are flowing more wind in this direction. So effectively what you are doing, you are having a lower induced angle of attack, and uh, you can still use the model. So this can still be used for the simulation purposes, for at least what's contrary during flight. So for the conclusion, we have the equilibrium is achieved during the entire transition, so we believe it can fly. Wingless significantly enhance elevon efficiency. We have the additional skin friction is not visible on the aerodynamic polar. We have that winglets, they are very useful in this case. They do not, they raise the plane efficiency and they offer themselves as a natural landing device. And for future work, we have, uh, we are very, we are looking forward for getting this wind tunnel experiments, the model, and we want to compare with real flight data and see if they all of them match and what we can learn from them as well. Okay, thank you for our attention. That was all. So, uh, please, any question? Yes. You have said that the maximum deflection that we need is about 28 degrees. And it's also the most efficient angle. Or you have talked about something about the efficiency test. Could you elaborate on that? Okay, we'll come back to that point. Okay, I will repeat the question. The question was about winglet efficiency, was that? Not the winglet efficiency, actually, it's the controlled surface. The maximum deflection that we need is about 28 degrees. Yes. And you have said that it's the most efficient point for the deflection. 
no, sorry. <laughs> what I said was that uh, we have that this range of angles between zero. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question was if at uh, 40, if 28 degrees was the most efficient position of the flap. But uh, sorry if I uh, missaid something, <laughs> but that was not what I meant. What I meant was that uh, the range from zero to 28, all the positions that the flap is in is w well within the flap efficiency that it is designed for. So we are not going to use the flap in a position that it was not designed for. Okay. Any, yeah, please. How much difference in leaf we get with and without the motor? I under okay. Yes, this is something. Okay, the question was about what about the lift, because the lift, uh, because of the rotors, because they are right in front of the wing, they are going to disturb the flow and they are going to disturb lift. This is something that exactly what the model the model wants to evaluate. We want to evaluate what is the induced wind speed and the induced angle so that we can compute the induced lift and induced drag due to the coupling you have between the propellers and the, and the fuselage itself, or the wings, if you want to call them that. Was that it? Why are you doing the experiments with the propeller on or off? In the propeller on or off? Because... Yes, actually when we did the wind tunnel, we did with on and off. Okay. So we have the both sets of data. So we can use off to compute the aerodynamic coefficients of the wing itself, of the fuselage itself, and we use it on to get the data of how much the it's disturbed the lift, the drag, all the aerodynamics is disturbed by the motor itself. Oh, okay, now I understand the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. Questions? Yes, please. Uh, a tilt wing is not as good as a fixed wing and not as good as a quad rotor. Don't you think it's better to have a carrier aircraft which you carry a quadcopter and drop at the building which is on fire and the quadcopter will go into the building? The question was, I will repeat the question exactly as was well stated. The, the tilt body is not as good as a helicopter and uh, it's not as good as a plane. So wouldn't it be better for me to use a carrier, a plane carrier, and drop the helicopter there? Yes, you can use that. I think it's not saying that it's going to be better, but we want to fuse the two abilities in one vehicle. You get more complexity out of it because you have two vehicles and uh, Okay, it's possible. It's also possible to uh, let's say yes, I wanted to say a pilot, but you, uh, it's not the point. <laughs> uh, we want to make it in one vehicle. We could make a carrier as well, but we are going to do two vehicles. Our idea now is to make one vehicle that can do the entire task and we want to make it as simple as possible so we can make it smaller. If you're going to put a carrier, 
okay, make you, maybe you can put very small carrier, a very small helicopter in a very small carrier and perform the same action, but that's just another philosophy. We are coming now for the philosophy of trying to put the same things on the same vehicle. I may have uh, one question, maybe you already answered it, but what is the maximum deflection of the uh, elevators? Maximum deflection in contrast doing transition equilibrium flight. Yeah, just the, the maximum, the, uh, the uh, because I for the design, the, yeah, you, you need at 28 degrees of deflection in the maximum. At what is the real maximum that you can uh, reach? The real maximum is 30. 30. 30 so for each side. Okay. My, my <laughs> next question. Next question is: If you are at this particular position where you already need uh, 28 uh, degrees of deflection. Then, what about your uh, rolling ability? Do you still have enough roll control? Because it's partially compensated by the fact that your, air your um, airflow coming from the motor is a bit higher, but do you still have the same uh, handling qualities on the rolling axis when you already need a lot of deflections uh, to sustain the pitch attitude? Do you have an yes. idea? I got an idea. For flight dynamics, we need to test it to see what will happen. But we, have, uh, we are looking forward to it because if you can see from the graph of efficiency that actually where we, go, we get, for when we add in winglets, you can see that the efficiency of the, when you have a right in the middle of the, of the graph, which is like, uh, you, you can see that you have the most gain in efficiency when it's a 40 angle of attack. And if we come to the other graph, a 40 angle of a deck is exactly where we have the 28. So exactly at this part, when we, we are at mass maximum deflection, is where the elevons are going to be more, efficiency, more efficient. So you need net less deflection of them to, pro to control it dynamically. One other question about the elephants. I see a, a, a rather significant gap between the wing and the elephant. Normally, that is detrimental for the efficiency of a flap. Did you design it in such a way that it is good, or...? The question was, as you can see here, there is a gap between the elevon and uh, the winglet. No, and it's... At the hinge of the, uh, uh, the elevon to the, to the wing itself. Ah, okay. So I put it here. Gap. Yes. Which usually is not beneficial. <coughs> yes, unless this is this well is a <laughs> unless very well designed. The question was: there is a difference here between the end of the no. of the elevon no. and no. the. No. Sorry, <laughs> I have to. The, this gap here between the wing okay, and the elevon. <laughs> That usually is very detrimental for the efficiency of the. Oh, aircraft. okay, sorry, you didn't say winglets no, at I any moment. Okay, that. sorry, I, I, <laughs> I misheard it. Okay, so there is a gap here at the. At the, at the, the question is, what about this gap at the elevon and the wings that might uh, reduce efficiency unless very well designed? We need. We didn't study that. <laughs> One thing you would get with that is the lift. Your flow would probably stay attached to the aileron uh, better. Your or your elevator, whichever you're calling it, it would stay attached a little better. And you're trying to use it to pitch trim, or for trim, it would be an advantage to have the gap there. If you're looking at just in terms of pure lift, it would probably be not as beneficial. But you would have flow attached. You would get Okay, so it I would not uh, I would uh, try at least to, to seal the gap with a flexible thing and see how much if it changes behavior. Okay. We have done that, we have sealed the gap, but we did never did actual measurements to see what's the difference without and with the gap. Any more questions? 
Okay, so thank you very much. So this ends the flight mechanics session, and uh, we have a few words from uh, Guido Ducron.